Hi. So last week we discussed uh, a dialectical contradiction or the interpenetration of two dialectical opposites, which is part and whole. This week we're going to discuss something which is actually quite very closely related, but it might not seem so at first, which is the question of free w freedom and determinism and the way in which necessity, as we say, expresses itself through chance. Now, as we discussed last week, um, the part and the whole are two, um, two opposites that cannot be separated, right? You cannot understand the one without the other. And in fact, the one expresses itself through the other. And it, so it is the same with freedom and necessity or necessity and chance. Now, Marxists, of course, are materialists, as we've discussed ex extensively. And for, for that means, of course, that we, we think that nothing can come from nothing. And therefore, anything that happens, happens for a reason. In other words, it's caused, it's conditioned by something else. And for that reason, we are known as determinists. And some people say that this means that we are actually fatalists, that Marxists have a kind of teleological belief that everything is sort of predestined, it, it has to happen. So capitalism has to give way to socialism. Socialism is absolutely inevitable. It's sort of written into the laws of the universe. And therefore, all we have to do is kind of wait for this inevitability to come about. Now, we are determinists, so that much is true. But the reason that this accusation of being fatalists is wrong is because it misunderstands dialectical determinism and it confuses it for, for crude kind of mechanical determinism. So to understand this, let's start with the question of causation. How do we define causation? Well, with this first, first glance, it seems very simple, right? Something happens because something caused it to happen and because there are laws of nature, it had to happen. There was no way it could have been otherwise. One thing begets another, basically, and it is necessary. Now, in a sense, that is true. Um, and this, this, however, the, the sort of limitations of this worldview, which I'll come on to in a moment, give rise to uh, concepts such as Laplace's demon. So Laplace was a, a philosopher, and he said, writing, I think, in the 18th century, that if only we were to know the exact position of every single part of the universe from the beginning and its exact velocity, then it would be possible to determine the future course of everything for, for all time. Because, of course, causation should mean that it's absolutely necessary for everything to happen in a set way, and therefore everything is rigidly determined. And this is a kind of pseudo-scientific idea, which you get a lot in, in, in certain kinds of what we would call crude determin sorry, crude materialism. Now, Engels pointed out in a quite brilliant passage the problems with this, this idea, this kind of simplistic thinking which thinks that everything can be reduced down to these very simple sort of equations, basically, which really grossly underestimates the complexity of the universe, basically. And Engels points out that the problem with this is, or one of the problems with this, is that um, whilst it seems to eliminate uh, accident or sort of arbitrariness and make everything understood and predictable, actually it does the opposite. It ends up reducing everything to the level of chance and, and losing necessity entirely. And uh, I'll just give this quotation because it's a very good quotation. It is rather long, so apologies for that. But Engels says the following. He says, according to this conception, only simple direct necessity prevails in nature. That a particular pea pod contains five peas and not four or six. That a particular dog's tail is five inches long and not a whit longer or shorter. And that this year a particular clover flower was fertilised by a bee and not another. And indeed by precisely one particular bee at a particular time. That a particular wind-blown dandelion seed had sprouted and another, and another not. That last night I was bitten by a flea at four o'clock in the morning and not at three or five o'clock and on the right shoulder and not on the left calf. These are all facts which have been produced by an irrevocable concatenation of cause and effect, by an unshatterable necessity of such a nature indeed, 
um, that the, the gaseous sphere from which the solar system was derived was already so constituted that these events had to happen thus and not otherwise. With this kind of necessity, likewise, we do not get away from the theological conception of nature. Whether with Augustine and Calvin we call it the eternal decree of God, or kismet as the Turks do, or whether we call it necessity, is all pretty much the same for science. There is no question of tracing the, uh, the chain of causation in any of these cases, so we are just as wise in one as in the other. The so-called necessity remains an empty phrase, and with it, chance also remains what it was before. This shows, I think, that if you eliminate one of the dialectical poles, so you only take necessity or you only take accident, you end up really having no ability to comprehend the, the question. You have to have both of these poles, in this particular case, necessity and chance. Now, of course, it's true that even the most incidental thing you can imagine does have a cause, and if you were to study, it would seem that it had to happen, and that is true. But is that cause generalizable? Is it essential to the nature of the thing? So, for example, if I get bit bitten by a flea, as Engel says, on my shoulder at 4 a.m., does that have the same necessity as, for example, the fact that over time I grow old? Is that sort of a general feature of my existence that I will get bitten by a flea? I think it's clear that it's not. So causation has to be understood more deeply uh, than as an endless chain of isolated cause and effects that uh, just go on forever and, you know, just a sort of single thread. In reality, it's more like a vast web of in which everything affects everything else and nothing exists in isolation. So whilst we, we often we think that we can say something like that, some, somebody died because they were knocked over by a car, and of course that might be the interesting and important fact that we want to highlight. In reality, of course, there is a whole, an infinite web of causes that enabled that to happen. If that person had simply left their house a bit later or earlier, walked a bit faster, had or hadn't bumped into somebody on the way, etc, etc. You can multiply these conditions at will. So actually everything that happens is really not caused by one thing, but the whole web of, of reality that, uh, that influences everything. So this is a kind of what we could call a universal causation, an all-sided causation. And with this, patterns emerge, um, general features, you know, that are, that are uh, patterns which are repeatable and predictable. Um, and, uh, and these are the more essential features of the matter, essentially. Um, because we can, not only can we predict these, these things, but we can understand the regular, we can understand the reason why they take place. Um, and, and, and that is really what we're after, basically. So, however, having said that, it, the, the accidental elements, these sort of incidental events that take place, remain absolutely vital for this because these general patterns these the, the necessity basically the laws or whatever can only exist because or through shall we say the this maelstrom of individual uh, relatively accidental things that take place there is no sort of necessity that exists outside of these particular events as Marx himself says at one point that if that were the case in other words if necessity did not express itself through chance the necessity itself would be mystical like how, how it comes to be that this particular pattern must exist uh, would be absolutely incomprehensible so we still need to have these sort of accidental elements in the equation we can't only talk about the sort of general patterns in this abstract way so we have both accident and necessity, each of which is equally vital to understand what is going on. Um, and this is, this is an outlook which has also been happened upon by modern science, particularly things like chaos theory or complexity theory. And this is because a lot of scientists started to realise that a lot of systems, particularly complex systems, such as the weather, and of course human society is another example, very, very complex systems, on the one hand have these kind of predictable patterns but on the other hand they are completely unpredictable and seemingly random at the same time 
and this is a kind of a huge kind of philosophical conundrum that people wrestle with how can it be both predictable and random does that really make any sense and the tendency for people is always to pick one side to say well no it's, it's not at all random it's completely uh, predictable or, or to go to the other extreme and say no, no it's totally random we can't understand anything of course our position is that it's both at the same time and, and we will i'm going to explain this further um but that you know there's countless examples of this um you, you know gases in which the parts the exact movements of the molecules is completely unpredictable but the, the behavior of the the the, the volume of them of, of of all of these particles as a whole is completely predictable the weather of course is, is one that i've mentioned as well you know the death rates in a society as well and these are actually this principle is probably something we're more familiar with than we realize we're familiar with the fact that even the healthiest person who is young uh, could just die tomorrow for you know no particular reason just a, a random event on the other hand we also think that it is to be expected that you know the average amount of people that die a year stays fa fairly constant most of the time and is, is very predictable which sort of seems paradoxical because you would think well if one person is unpredictable then surely like 50 million people is 50 million times more unpredictable but actually it's not that that way at all um so well, why is this and how do we explain this well as we discussed in previous weeks the law or the necessity or if you like the pattern whatever you want to call it um, does not exist externally to the thing themselves as i said earlier it expresses itself through these accidents uh, and I, this I, this was understood by marx when he says the following and if this is a very fa famous quotation from him history does nothing it possesses no immense wealth it wages no battles it is man real living man who does all that who possesses f and fights History is not, as it were, a person apart, using man as a means to achieve its own aims. History is nothing but the activity of men pursuing his aims, or man pursuing his aims. So here it's almost, it almost seems as if Marx might be stressing the randomness or the accidental character of society, that it's just men doing whatever they want, and almost as if there is no law to society. But of course Marx does not think that. So how do we explain that? Well, the randomness that scientists might talk about with the weather system or that we could talk about with society this is should be understood as only a relative thing it's not absolutely random or without causation right so take take society each given person in society of course it is unique and it's it is unpredictable in the detail exactly what they will do with their lives on any given day that can't be you can't say that because we know this person's class background we know that tomorrow they're going to do this that's ridiculous and yet at the same time people do exist individuals do exist in a social context and they are molded by that context people are unfortunately they might protest but they are types by and large people do largely conform to the types of you know for example the class background that they have and many other things that condition them as well besides class um, so people aren't actually so unique so uniqueness if you like turns out to be a relative term um, people are types that people also are unique and in, in the detail basically uh, people are influenced by other things and, and moreover they they have certain interests you know if you come from a certain class then you have certain interests which no matter what your personality is those interests will probably exert themselves over time there are exceptions of course people who break from their class background and do very exceptional things but by and large people are molded by their social environment in that way so although we say they're random that yes they are random in the detail most people of course don't stray from the path too much and therefore and there are good reasons for that that we can explain which i've just mentioned you know that the social environment the interests that they have so over time or if you like across society you know one exception is balanced out by another exception in the opposite direction and these averages therefore yeah they compensate one another and we get a pattern emerging we get a predictability to society and therefore we have if you like necessity emerging through this sort of maelstrom of of random individuals but of course as i've said only so random um and so this shows how the individual contains the whole within themselves the, the you know the one side of the opposite contains the other side or express is expressed through it in other words the individual 
is also partly a type, is part of their class, is, and, and, and is probably conforms to it to a large extent. On the other hand, the necessity or, you know, the, the sort of um, the lawfulness of society can only exist through these relatively unique, relatively random individuals. And this is why we say after Hegel that necessity expresses itself through chance. So if we take, for example, social revolution, if a social revolution is necessary, right, if they really ne society needs to have a revolution because of its the state that it's in, this can't happen sort of because outside of society this law exists and then sort of orders society to have a revolution and to have it exactly on time and in exactly the right way. As I said earlier, such a law would be mystical and incomprehensible. I mean, where would it exist? How would it gain its power over society? It's just, it's nonsense. Um, so, although the, the, the revolution is necessary, it can only express itself, if you like, through the more or less unique individuals that make up society. Um, and of course, those people are unpredictable. And even the, the leaders of revolutions are relatively unpredictable in, in the detail, if you like. Um, so, on the one hand, revolutions have general features for the, for the because of the structure of society. On the other hand, that each revolution is also uh, unique, and it happens, if you like, in it you could say in an imperfect way. Um, take a concrete example from recent history. In uh, twenty ten, at the end of twenty ten, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi set himself on fire in Tunisia. So that was a relatively accidental event in the sense that, um, you know, this was to do with the detail of his own personal life. But that, once that accident had happened, that sparked off a social revolution in Tunisia. And it sparked off, in fact, the whole of the Arab Spring. And the fact that it spread not just to Tunisia, but the rest of the Arab world shows that there was a general need for that. In other words, capitalism in these countries had become so unbearable and the regimes they lived under had become so unbearable that seeing this man killing himself in this way was enough to make people rise up and to and to to sort of organize a revolution essentially um, and in fact this randomness of the, the event is actually once again only so random because of course the very same unbearableness of capitalism in tunisia is also to a certain extent the reason that he he set himself on fire although we can't obviously generalize this and say that all revolutions in tunisia will always be caused by someone setting themselves on fire that of course there is still this uniqueness to the events um but the point is that the the conditions being ripe for revolution that was all that was needed and it wasn't really just him setting himself on fire that caused the revolution but the whole all, the whole the build up of all of the contradictions um in Tunisian society, of course. So we are determinists, of course, but we do not imagine because of that, that we are able to understand and to predict everything that will ever happen and to know exactly when a revolution will take place or, or something like that and just fold our hands and wait for it to happen. So this brings me on to the final thing I wanted to discuss, which is the question of freedom. Um, this is a very tired debate in philosophy. You know, are we free or are we determined? And it's usually put as if if it turns out that we are determined, in other words, we're caused and those causes are predictable, there's no such thing as morality because, you know, somebody kills someone just because of the composition of their body or what they ate for breakfast that day. And therefore people say, well, we have to accept freedom if we're to accept moral responsibility. Um, this is not a debate that Marxists are hugely interested in, but the question of freedom itself is very important. So, <clears throat> of course, for us, the idea of freedom without causation you know, that somebody isn't caused in any way by or determined by their, their composition and, and things like that and is, and is therefore unpredictable and has absolute freedom. This is nonsense. It's unscientific. And if you think about it, it's not desirable or a good thing. If, if somebody were to do something purely just, what well, just for random, you know, not because of their composition or any, anything in their life experience, but just randomly, that, that wouldn't really be a good thing. On the other hand... Um, we don't deny freedom, but we give it a real material content. We give it a proper explanation for the first time rather than having it as this fictitious abstraction. For us, freedom, for Marxists, freedom means, again after Hegel, the recognition of necessity. In other words, you cannot escape causation, but if you understand its principles in the given case, then you can uh, act with freedom. So, 
to give a classic example, if we want to fly, we can't simply fantasize about flying and then fly. We have to understand the laws of aerodynamics and things like that. And then we can build planes and things which enable us to fly. And therefore, in a sense, we have the freedom to fly, which would otherwise not be possible. So consciousness is absolutely essential for freedom because consciousness is what enables us to understand these laws that we we live in and, and are determined by rather than just being kind of blindly uh, affected by them. And then we can manipulate these laws to to meet our, our needs really and to live better essentially and that therefore is freedom. So consciousness is absolutely vital and that shows why we need to build a revolutionary party. Yes, there are laws to capitalism and, and yes, I would say it's inevitable that capitalism goes into crisis and provokes revolutions. That is true. But um, on the other hand, um, we need to consciously recognise those laws in order to realise them. And in this sense, social laws, the laws of human society, are somewhat different to the laws in the rest of the natural world because consciousness plays a role. So whilst the bourgeoisie cannot prevent a revolution from happening because, you know, the laws of capitalism cannot be escaped from and, and, and revolutions will happen, they can't prevent them from happening, but they can um, sort of sabotage them, if you like. And certainly they do that. You know, they bribe our leaders, for example. They, you know, they corrupt workers' organisations. They use every means at their disposal to confuse our, our movement, basically. And they've done so many, many times in history. They've shown that no matter how much there is an objective need for revolution and for socialism, it doesn't necessarily come to full completion because of the conscious intervention of the bourgeoisie. And so therefore it follows that we need to recognise necessity as well. We need to recognise that revolutions can and must take place and therefore build an adequate organisation to realise that necessity, which is, of course, a revolution. That doesn't mean that creating, sorry, a revolutionary party, that doesn't mean that a revolutionary party can create a revolution at will and that necessity is no longer important. Um, but it means that we can, we can uh, th these laws can be um, consciously used rather than sort of um, sabotaged by the other side, if you like. And that is, history has shown that that is absolutely vital. And so what this kind of philosophical understanding uh, tells us is that, um, uh, is that far from not having to fight for socialism, this understanding should give us every confidence of the need for socialism and therefore the fact that we can and we must build a party that can help us to carry out the socialist revolution. Lenin stated that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Without a revolutionary theory, we are bound to take in the ideas that surround us. Under capitalism, these are ideas that ultimately defend the status quo. In Wellrad's upcoming book on the history of philosophy, Alan Woods looks at the development of philosophical thinking from the ancient Greeks all the way through to Marx and Engels, who brought together the best of previous thinking to produce the Marxist philosophical outlook, which looks at the real material world, not as a static, immovable reality, but one that is constantly changing and moving according to laws that can be discovered. Through this, we can learn how philosophy becomes an indispensable tool in the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of society. Pre-order your copy now at www.marxist.com/hop.